As for today's program, we are so lucky to have this incredible woman. She's a mother, she's an author, she is on a, was on a fabulous show and is now an expert on fashion. She, she, had a, she was a red carpet fashion expert and she's a New York Times best-selling author. Joining her today from Turner Classic Movies is the very handsome and very knowledgeable Dave Carger. I'm sure you see him. I think it's Channel 70 in the desert. So now, please help me welcome Melissa Rivers and Dave Carger. Losing a shoe. Cinderella almost lost a shoe coming up the stairs. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Dave. It's so great to see you. It's so great to see all of you. I want to thank Debbie and Jamie and Helene and everybody involved with the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival for having both of us. I'm new here to the desert. I moved here two years ago, so I'm so happy to be doing my first event here um, in conjunction with this festival, and I'm so happy that it's with you, Melissa, because we kind of go back. <laughs> too many years. I was on uh, the E! Channel with Melissa and her mom on the Golden Globes. This was probably 15, 16 years ago. You're being, you're having a very, you're, you're having a, a memory issue. How long ago? We started the red carpets, ready for this, make you feel awful, in, it was either 96 or 97. Makes you feel bad right now, doesn't wow. it? Wow. <laughs> so it might have been 20 years ago that I, because I did it once with you. Anyway, now I get to go on her podcast. Yes, uh, group text, all the time. And it's so much fun. So now I get to be the one asking you the questions. So Which is a little is... bit alarming. <laughs> so we're here to talk about, in large part, this wildly entertaining book that you've written called Lies My Mother Told Me, which came out six months ago. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. I've I been on it... a, a, a very long book tour. And it's book number four. four. What would you say, because you have all these different aspects to your career, television, social media, podcasting, what are you able to do with your books that you're not able to do with any other part of your career? I'm allowed to say things that I can't say necessarily on a podcast, during an interview, in public, on a TV show. Anyway, that's my writing partner, Larry Amrose, who is here, who's a desert, a desert dweller himself. Yes. And he's laughing because... We write things and then we send them off to be looked at by like an editor or someone who we trust before we put them out there and they send it back with like X's <laughs> through everything. <laughs> Cause you know, it gives me a chance to really push the envelope. Without a doubt. Without, oh, 100%. And luckily there are people in my life that say, really, is this line, is it that funny that you want to be canceled? And sometimes I think, I, sometimes I actually have to think about it, and sometimes I go like, fuck it, leave it in. And then I always get like a good night's sleep, and like quick, pull it out. Yeah. What has the response been in the last six months since this came out? Have, has there been any pushback from any No, angle? no, and I think it's because everything that's truly edgy or <laughs> walking the line has been written in my mother's voice. And that was has allowed us to get away with so much in the book because people keep saying, you know, wow, did she really say these things? I'm like, mm, no, but, you know, maybe a version of, but it allowed us the, the creative freedom, I hate saying those things, like when actors say, my craft. No, you're acting, like it's a right. job. <laughs> um, it allows us the freedom to be able to say things that if I said them, I'd be dead in the water. So, so your mom is a scapegoat. 100%. In, for this book. Well, being her daughter, I've spent so many years in therapy. I feel like it's... <laughs> Like I'm like I've owed this. It's helping pay the bills. And God, poor Cooper. He's you know, he hasn't even realized how fucked up he is. <laughs> so essentially, this is only a a book that could exist after your mom had passed. Really, people ask me what would my mother's reaction be to this, and I say she would be very upset. She didn't think of it. Oh, um, right. well, no, because what she always said, and this is. There are people who can test it. She always wanted to write 
like our version of Mommy Dearest mm. and put it in the safety deposit box. And that way it was ready to go as soon as she died. Like immediately, like done, sent out. She would have tried to pre-sell it, I'm sure. <laughs> But she wanted a done manuscript in the safety deposit box because her answer was, I'm dead, I don't care. Do what you need to do. Right. So, so whatever happened to that idea? I think I actually said, Mom, that's sick. And, <laughs> and then now I regret it. I could have had a second home. Right. <laughs> I mean, she was right. I look back at that. She's like, what the fuck do you care what people think? Yeah. You know? So, okay, so when did the realization between you and Larry, your, your writer, co-writer, and let's say your book editor, or whoever it was, that there was this kind of opportunity to write a book like this um, right now? It started out, people were constantly asking me, constantly asking me, sorry, I know I keep turning because I feel like the chairs are a little, you know, I'm gonna make it a little more open, sorry, <laughs> don't kill me. This way I can see more people. Um, uh, people were always asking me, what would your mother be saying about this? And what would she be thinking about this? And it was all during 2016 and all the oh. crazy. Um, and everything that ensued and going into COVID. And Larry and I talked about it, and I'm like, God, this would be a great article or an op-ed. And we started working on it, thinking, how would I respond to this? Or how would she be responding to these things? And then we thought, ooh, this could be a really funny book. And we wanted to write sort of the history of the world as told by my mother. <laughs> and then, honestly, Larry, you probably don't even remember this. I, ha we were, I was obsessed with somehow getting Napoleon on Elba and the issue being there wasn't a Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that? I was going to make it work at all costs. And then suddenly we were like, this is all lies. Lies my mother told me. Like, oh, this is cute. So we wrote a bunch of chapters and had the agent send it out and got very interesting response from different publishing houses. Um, again, a lot of people keep saying, is this a memoir? And I kept saying, no, um, just read it. You'll, it. It's obvious it's not a memoir. But my favorite response before we found Post Hill was someone said, um, our lawyers don't think they can clear this. <laughs> and I'm like, no. I'm the estate. Like, I would be the person suing. <laughs> then I think to myself, wouldn't that be fantastic PR? Me suing the estate, which is really me. Right. And then I'm like, oh, but maybe it's me, Cooper suing me. And then I'm like, he'll never go for that. Um, so that was the strangest reaction we got, mm. was we don't think that we can get this past legal. Mm. Their loss. Right. So, yeah, it was people really did not know what to make of it. But we wrote most of it during COVID, and it saved us. It saved me. It, it was mm. a couple times a week we knew I was going to be laughing. It kept us sane. It kept me sane. It, it, it really helped because it was something to do and something that was fun and funny and we would just get on our calls and be laughing hilariously. And it was all good until he hit writer's block. And then after he was done with it, I hit it. So <laughs> that we ended up turning it in like an hour, or like almost a year late because we were both stuck. Luckily not on Elba without a Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> so is that the process? Is it kind of like a tag team in a way? It's, we get together, or now that Larry lives out here, we get on the phone. And we just start coming up with absolutely ridiculous sort of germs of ideas. And then we keep thinking and talking and thinking, and then sort of one kind of works its way to the top or something else turns into something else like it did with this book. And then it's just we go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and, and stupid ideas and funny ideas and mm. fixing things and things ending up going a different direction. It's like, it's like anything. It's, it's, it's definitely constantly a work in progress. So... For people who have not read it yet, the conceit of this book is that it's lies that your mother told you. But when you get into it, as you've just alluded to, you quickly learn that that's a cover, a cover for you to just be hilarious and, and tell these funny, completely ridiculous stories. But it also led me to think, is there a basis, in fact, as a concept? 
was your mom that kind of person who would enjoy, you know, either on purpose or just because it was easier, you know, pulling one over on you? Is that something she would like to do, or is this just an invented conceit? Oh, she was a terrible liar and did it all the time. <laughs> About things like what? I just stupid stuff. First of all, she used to, when she was home and she didn't want to talk to anybody, she would answer the phone with a really bad French accent. <laughs> like people didn't know it was her. Hello? <laughs> and I'm like, and then someone would take, oh, it sounds really, oh, hi. I'm like, mom, you're not disguising your voice. Like this does not work. <laughs> At all. So she would do that. She just always thought it would be, you know, she would embellish. And there were plenty of times I said, Mom, that's not how it happened. I get kicked under the table. Because she's like, it's, the truth can be boring. Yeah, it's like. And a, you never want to be dull. People say, don't let the facts get in the way, way of, a of a good, good story. story. Right. Yes, yes. That, that was, a clean that was that. definitely, a, a, I think, Mar, but we, uh, what do we used to say? We said, she lived truth adjacent. <laughs> she wouldn't flat out lie. <laughs> It was just truth adjacent. Right. And a lot of them came, that stuff she told me as a child or whatever came back to bite her. Mm. Because eventually I would be like, so there was a story, it's not in the book, which is this is a true story of a real lie. Follow that. (laughs) So I was always told, oh, my mother, you know, she's like, I worked all the way through my pregnancy and it was so easy and... I gave birth to you, and it felt nothing, and it was easy, blah, blah, blah. So I have a horribly rough pregnancy with Cooper, and I keep trying to work through it, and terrible morning, ended up on bed rest, felt awful, the whole thing, and we got into this huge fight. Why are you pushing yourself? What are you doing? I'm like, well, that's what you did. And she stops, and she looks at me. She goes, huh? (laughs) And she goes, oh, please. I worked at night. She goes, I would get up in the morning, throw up, go back to sleep all day, work at the night, come home, eat something, go back to sleep. She's like, I wasn't doing that much. <laughs> and she's like, you're running yourself ragged. And this literally was like a knockdown drag out. And then I'm about to have him, and Cooper had to be induced, and I was terrified and the whole thing. And she's like, all my life, I heard, oh, Melissa, it's so easy. <laughs> so easy. They gave me one shot of painkiller. It was easy. <laughs> and like, my mom's pretty tough. I'm like, mm, Okay. So I was, so I don't know what you're so scared of. Finally, I pressed her on the subject. I go, did they give you this shot IV or just like in the arm? She goes, oh, IV. I go, what was she? goes, I think it was Demerol. I'm like, they gave you IV Demerol drip. That is why it didn't hurt. I'm like, they could do open heart surgery with you awake on that. She goes, yeah. Like I said, like one shot of something, it was all good. And I'm like, oh my God. So that was like a real lie that she didn't really know was a lie, but was actually a lie that came back to bite her in the ass. I love it. Yeah. You know, it's it's a real joy for someone like me. I think I was 15 years old, 16 years old when someone gave me a cassette tape of your mom's uh, What Becomes a Semi-Legend Most. And that comedy show is like, if you guys don't know it, it's just like the most classic thing ever. Mm -hmm. And it's just so fun in the book to page through and discover that thematically you're talking about, like, you know, I I discovered what what a tramp was from your mom, right? You know, like, she's a tramp. And then just to see that kind of, those those topics and themes percolate in the book is just a thrill. You're being so, like, sort of using this very intellectual... (laughs) Verbiage um, to say like, oh, I call someone a whore. You know what I mean? He's like, oh, like tramp. I'm like, oh, I think we refer to a number of people as whores. Right. Okay, you can say it because right, but it's so classy, Dave. Classy, classy. classy. I'm sorry, your mom can say it. Classy. Right. But did you do you find that you have similar interests? comically speaking, comedically speaking, or were you trying to pay homage to your mom with some of it? What were the similarities there? Really trying to channel her voice mm. and her rhythms and how far I, we could push that. Um, you know, she has such a distinct rhythm. And it's something that, you know, I obviously grew up hearing, so I know the rhythm, so we knew how to write in that cadence, which is such a quick cadence. Um, how am I different? I think I'm much... I'm, my humor is actually much closer to my dad's, oh. which was much more sarcastic and much drier versus 
my mother's who was joke, 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 sarcastic aside, joke. And mine sort of more sarcasm, 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 you know. Um, and also what people don't know, and this is something people are always fascinated to learn, is my mother's offstage sense of humor was very silly and very sophomoric and loved practical jokes and loved, you know, when she, when she was able to get a whoopee cushion with Cooper and hide it around the house, that was hours of them cracking up. <laughs> you know, anything silly. She had a very silly sense of humor off stage. not, and yes, obviously sophisticated, but really her real house was giggling silly, you know, mm. one step from saying to Cooper, pull my finger, mm. you know. You know, when I read through this book, I'm reminded of other contemporary essayists, comedic essayists that I love, like Gary Janetti or David Sedaris even. Are there people that you, that are inspirational to you who are writing in that form? Well, I know Gary, so it's hard for me to say like, I love Gary Janetti. I love Gary Janetti because I know him personally and he's hilarious. Um, obviously, I'm a Sedaris fan who isn't. Um, do I find inspiration? I think that I've discovered, and I don't know, it's just because I can't concentrate, but I'm not ADD. God forbid everybody's like ADHD. I'm like, no, I just have a short attention span. Um, <laughs> have trouble writing in longer form. Mm. This seem the short essay seems to be my wheelhouse because otherwise I wander, I meander. And um, someone was just saying the other day, oh, I, I don't know if any of you remember or know who a man named George Slaughter is. I just went to a thing where they honored George and his daughter was speaking about how she used to get in trouble in English class because all we know how to do is write with ellipses and, par and par parentheticals. And it's like, oh my God, that's how I write. Everything is ellipses, in a parentheses, an asterisk with a funny footnote. And you realize like, you can't really write a novel that way. It gets very confusing. So it's better to, to, to stick to the shorter form. And I think, I think I have more fun with the shorter form. Larry and I, this is our fourth, third or fourth book together. It's where we work best. But again, that's how I grew up. Get in, make them laugh, get out. Mm. In a general sense, I find it really interesting. Did that answer your question? Big time. Okay. A lot of people who have a well-known parent or parents they run away from it, they, they're over it, they don't want to be just the kid of the parent, and you're not. But at the same time, you really embrace the fact that you are Joan Rivers' daughter, and, and your father's daughter, too. Has it always been that way? Was there a period of time where you, like, where you were like, I don't want to answer questions about her right now, or, and then you came back around? What, what has the journey been for you? In a lot of ways, I think I was sort of forced to embrace it by the nature of the twists and turns that my career took. There was not some great grand scheme to end up working together. It was completely by happenstance. Um, everyone's like, really? I'm like, yeah. To the point where when E came to her and she'd done one show without them and asked if I would be interested in doing that, I was already on CBS News. I had already done MTV. I had just shot a pilot for my own show. I was second in line behind Ricky Lake. Like, I was off doing my own thing, and we must have been having a bad day because she said, I don't know, you'll have to call her because if I ask her, she'll just say no. Mm. And Is that true at that time? Would I have said no? Yeah. I, if I was in a bad mood and she was being irritating, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a real mother-daughter relationship. Right. You know, but I love the fact that my mother said to them, if you ask her, she'll just say no. But... And it's something, it was never any grand scheme of that this was going to be what happened. And we had no idea if E was going to work. It was a complete flyer. And to be honest, neither of us were working. So it's like mm. my, the, sh the pilot I had shot for Paramount didn't get picked up. She was sort of at a, not a crossroads, but a quiet moment. She had done the one. She used to say, oh, God, this is like the lowest of the low cable standing outside a building mm. talking to people like oh my god this is embarrassing but this is what and who knew that it was going to take off that it became the perfect storm mm. 
Okay, here's an aside that I'm sure you've been asked, but I don't know the answer, so I'm going to ask. Who are you wearing? Did, is, did that literally come out of her mouth? Or was, there, was it a producer who said, this is a way to phrase it? Is it something you guys had heard? Came right out of her mouth in a moment of desperation. <laughs> In a panicky moment. I mean, she always loved clothes. She always loved designers. She was always a fashion person, all of those things. Um, but literally, like, on the red carpet, she was desperate for a question. I think she was trying to say, what are you wearing? And it came out, who are you wearing? And that was that. Brilliant. Just like she says, can we talk? Popped out of her night, stay on her, out of her mouth one night on stage back in Greenwich Village. And she went, oh. that makes sense. I love it. You know, she passed away so suddenly. Yes, so, she did. So surprisingly, so shockingly, so horribly. When you had kind of gotten over the shock of that and you were taking stock of your life professionally speaking, I'm talking about, what did you figure out you still wanted to do or could still do on your own? And what did you think, like, now that like, she's not here, I probably don't want to do this. How did you kind of navigate your career on your own at the beginning? You know, it it came almost from a place of panic. I wish I could say, oh, well, I sat down with my representatives and we thought, this is the master plan. Um, no, there was none of that. Um, the first thing was, what are we going to do about fashion police? Because that was a juggernaut. Um, so that was, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to put it on, on hold. We're going to put it on hiatus. Who's going to replace her? What are we going to do? So that became sort of the first thing. The second thing, and we were actually dealing with this while she was in the hospital, and we didn't know if she was going to die or not, canceling all of her club dates. Mm. So we dealt with that actually there because she was literally about to go out on tour. So you have to let the promoters know and this and that, and, and it was crazy. Um, then it was fashion police and what's going to happen and what do we do? Should the show go on? I never sat down and thought what's going to happen to me until probably a year later. And it's been incredibly difficult because I'm sort of trapped in this weird um, gray area that people don't know what to do with me. And my mother always used it because they produced Fashion Police. And I was one of, the one of the creators and producers on the red carpet and the original Fashion Police and written the books and the reality show and all these different things. And even our little stupid show, In Bed with Joan, was my idea. And she always used to say to me, you will never get credit for what you have done. It will always be pinned on to me. And it used to really frustrate her. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, right. But I do see that. Mm -hmm. And I do live with that. And it's very difficult. And there are days that I'm very frustrated and people love to book me for stuff. Nobody wants to pay me because nobody thinks I need to be paid, which my accountant would disagree with. <laughs> my business manager's like, please stop doing things for free. I'm like, it's the only way I'm getting work, um, except for my books. But that's all changing now. But there was never, once I got over the, all the fashion police drama and the stop start, and then I had to quit E for them to make me the host eventually, because nobody wanted to hear what I intrinsically knew her fans and the fans of the show would want. Um, all of a sudden, I kind of went like, oh, now what? I wish I probably put more thought into it, but I think I was flying in such a state of panic and fear and denial and everything that goes around losing a parent, especially if you're only child and you were very close I didn't realize I should have probably been a little bit more thoughtful. In general, are you a, with all, because you do have a lot of different avenues, a lot of different things. Are you a self-starter or, or are you the kind of person who most things happen because people come and approach you or is it a combination? I think it's a little bit of a combination, but nobody approaches me with shit. <laughs> so if I don't figure it out, I'm fucked. <laughs> Sorry my language, but it's true. <laughs> so, you know, if I don't figure it out, I'm screwed. You know, I think back I to... I wish someone would just come. I always remind my agent, I'm like, you know, I'm still just a gun for hire. Right. I'm more than happy to show up and hair and makeup, do my job and go home and not to be, you know, the person in charge who loses sleep. It's interesting because I don't know how long ago it was 
during Fashion Police when it was uh, Juliana Rancic who made a comment. I think it was about Zendaya, and Zendaya had been wearing dreads. It was such a ridiculous, frustrating... I, I literally... There's so many sides of the story that it's absurd. And the fact that it took over my life mm. for however many weeks still angers me. But I feel like that was the beginning of, of the this end. cycle that we're in. Where like a show like Fashion Police, there would be a controversy like that every week now. Oh, you can do people say to me, why won't you bring back Fashion Police? I'm like, I'm saying what? So I love this actress and she's beautiful and she's a good person. And, you know, she's an amazing human and she's very smart. The dress, I'm not sure if I would have picked that for her, but I'm not saying that the designer mm -hmm. isn't incredibly talented and, you know, gives money to small children living on the street and is such a good person and dresses people that are not a size two. But I'm not 100% sure this is my favorite work, even though all of their work is brilliant. Mm -hmm. That is like the most boring show in the you world. You can hear the channel flipping. Yes, but that's off of all it. you could do now. And the actress is a good person, even though we all know she goes home and beats the children and kicks the dog. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the dog, and body, body positive. You can't dare say, right. you know, as I always say, you know, crop shirts are, you know, a privilege, not a right. Mm. <laughs> you know? People don't get that. And now when you're driving and you see people in that, white leggings and shorts that show their butts, it's a privilege, not a right. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> what, um, what in your life makes you think about your mom? Like, is, is there something that you, like a smell or a store that you drive by? Like, besides her career and, you know, something that somebody will say, what in your everyday life makes you think of oh, her? Oh, God, everything. Everything, you know, everything from I have one of her sweaters in my closet to I have one of the jars from her, you know, dressing table on mine to, I mean, what doesn't? But I think people always expect that when you lose a parent or someone who's famous that your grief experience is different. Mm. It's not. Grief is grief is grief. Losing someone is losing someone is losing something. It does not matter if the person was famous or not famous. It's exactly the same. Mm. What do you miss the most about both your parents? Well, I was daddy's girl. So I miss that someone has my back when mommy's bananas and you're a bad teenager. <laughs> um, <laughs> How old were you when your dad passed? I was 18. Oh, my. 19, 18, 19. I was in college. I was drinking a lot. I don't know. I had a lot of fun in college. <laughs> a lot of fun in college. Um, and then, what do I miss? I miss laughing about things that nobody else would understand. Hmm. That only we would understand. Hmm. That's what I miss. When you think about your career and all the different things that you have gotten to do, and I, I hear the struggles that you're talking about, but you also have achieved a lot. What would you say surprises you the most? Uh, I mean, if we're going to talk about what you were able to accomplish with your mom, but then also what you've been able to accomplish on your own with all of these, all of this writing, for instance, what's most surprising to you, hopefully in a good way, about what, <laughs> about, about what you've been able to do? What's the most surprising? I think the most surprising has been, um, oh God, it has to be a thing, doesn't it? I mean, for me, I, I started out as a magazine writer. I never thought I'd be on television. So like the fact that I now have a job on TV, that's just a huge shock to me because it's just not something that was in my sphere of vision. But I mean, and maybe for you it was, maybe because you grew up with someone who was in the public eye, it... It, it was something that was possible to me. I know what it is, is that people think I'm a fashion expert. <laughs> <laughs> That's what caught me by the like, you really want my opinion? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have one. <laughs> you know, but I always look in my closet and I'm just like, I'm like, I got nothing to wear and all is the same. And then you make buy something stupid and it's a bad decision. And But sometimes you make good decisions. But I think it's the fact that people are like, you're an expert. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> 
Run with it. I do. <laughs> Made a whole career out, exactly, of a, yeah. out of a lie. Right. How right. perfect. Well, one of the things that's super fun about the book, and again, this is all very, you know, hyper exaggerated, but yes. that's also what's fun about it. Well, it says on here, a work of nonfiction with the word non crossed right. out. <laughs> More you- people come up to me and say, oh, is this a memoir? Okay, read the cover. <laughs> or just read the about the author, which says, I'm the cultural affairs minister for the country of Peru. Right, right. For a heartbeat, I was like, oh, Melissa. Oh, wait. Of course, that's a lie. <laughs> um, but it, it does delve into these fun kind of made-up yes. stories about what a crazy childhood you had, you know, gallivanting around the world with your mom and going to Vegas and all these crazy stories. But it led me to think, what would you say was super normal? about your childhood, if, if you can be objective about it. Oh, I can't. People ask me about this all the time. Um, my parents did everything humanly possible to create an incredibly traditional childhood when we were inside the gates of our house. Um, private school, expectations, which I know is like a bad word now with parents, we're supposed to let them find themselves and be who they want to be. No, you still have to get good grades and not get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, manners, thank you notes, polite, chores. My parents were strict. Um, and I created as much of a traditional childhood and always made me extremely aware that fake life, work life, and real life we're vastly different. Mm. This life is work, job, public. This is who we really are. And I would always the story I always tell, which surprises everybody, is until the day my mom died, I maybe had half a dozen friends that called her Joan, and I thought that was very daring. All of my friends, the day she died, either called her Mrs. Rosenberg or Mrs. R. And her phone in her apartment until the day she died was answered Rosenberg residence. It was very much too... This was a character. Mm. This was what we used to call the career, and we all fed the career. It was like another entity. This was real life over here. Mm. And you get good grades, and you go to college, and you do this, and you do that, and you are polite, and there are expectations that you live up to, and expectations were not a terrible word in child rearing. Um, and that surprises people the most. Mm. Were you, so you were a West Coast West Coast. Gal. We moved to, uh, everyone thinks I grew up in New York. That's another big surprise. Um, we moved to California when I was three. Wow. And then I got my ass shipped back east for college. Right. <laughs> Kicking my- and screaming. I mean, who really wants to leave my parents' Ma- Malibu beach house to go live in West Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't go, I was like <laughs> hanging on to the door. While, you can't make me go. They're like, yes, we can. Yeah, but there's no Ivy League colleges on the West Coast. I know. Back. Um, it must have been so interesting for you. I mean, your mom was doing all of this great comedy when you were way too young to understand it. It must have been a very interesting process for you to grow up and slowly but surely get the jokes. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, they say that kids are parrots. and they'll parrot. So I guess by the time I was like six years old, apparently I could recite my mother's entire act. <laughs> um, and when she hadn't been on the road for a little while, she said she would get into the bath and bring me, have me come and sit in the bathroom. And she would say, tell me my act. And so she would remember her act before she went on the road. And there's something hilarious about like an eight-year-old going, first wife, second wife, you know, that kind of thing. That's Telling cool. Heidi Abramowitz jokes. There's some there, in here. There, yes, you know. I was so thrilled to see that name. You know, don't tell me a man is brave. You know, every woman in this room, every woman in this world, in this room is brave. Brave is making a gynecologic appointment and showing and up. Showing up. Um, so yeah, I'm you know eight year olds. I don't know what that means, but I'm just like you know, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about kind of life on the red carpet that you and I have that in common. Yes. Um, who do you miss seeing and talking to? on the carpet? Who were your, some of your favorite people when they would walk up? Anyone having fun. Miss George Clooney. You miss all the comedians. Well, most of the comedians were always fun and great. The people who were lovely and nice. You miss a Nicole Kidman. You mm. miss a Clooney. You miss the Tom Hanks. You miss these people because they 
they got it. Mm. They got that this was a part of the job and B, it was fun. And it, my mom used to say for us anyway, it was like the world's greatest cocktail party. You talk to everybody for two minutes and you don't ever <laughs> see them again the rest of the night. <laughs> so I was like, this is, and that was so true. I mean, and then when you do a red carpet on the other side, it is like, <sighs> you know, you want to die. But your job is to make it look fun and interesting. Mm. Just as our job is also to ask a question that they're not going to be asked 50 times. Because I always am like, the worst is when you're doing a red carpet and you see the person not even listening mm. and they're reading off the card and the questions have zero creativity. Now, I'm not saying we shall have creative questions, but at least engage, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because half the time to, you're talking to them and you go, and then that's when I murdered the child, and they go, have a great evening. Right, yeah. Good luck tonight, you right. know. They're not listening at all. It's just horrible. Yeah, that one would need a follow-up question. Yeah, one right. would hope, but usually right. they're not yeah. even listening, right. so it doesn't much matter. But it's funny, because the people that you mentioned as your favorites, George Clooney, Nicole Kidman, Tom Hanks, they were some of my favorites, too. And this was surprising to me to learn, to figure this out over the years, is that it's usually the really, really big people who have the most fun with it and aren't oh, don't seem over it, and it's some of the newer people Ugh. who are having the worst time. And you realize it's because maybe they're just so scared. There must. Oh, be I don't give it scared. <laughs> don't give me scared. <laughs> you know, yes, it can be overwhelming, and intimidating. But then be honest and say it's overwhelming and intimidating. You know, you always hear actors like, oh, "This isn't why I got into it." Okay, then go do. There's amazing theater companies and repertory countries <laughs> all over the world. If you don't want to be known, don't do a $50 million movie. <laughs> you know, sure. you can do your craft somewhere else. You don't need to be in a Marvel costume. Do you and have, then complain. No, no. Right. Do or you, don't leave your house. When you, also, you right. live in your $25 million mansion. That doing that afforded you, once you're in public, you are a public figure. Mm. And they, your fans own you whether you like it or not. They pay for the ticket. They buy the book. They do those things. Respect that. Did you ever hear about people who you later found out they were terrified to come talk to you and your mom or didn't want to? Oh, yeah. Like who? Oh, yeah. Oh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> everyone. <laughs> You know, but then there's people who you have fun with and you love and you know, and you have this sort of fun relationship. And Yeah, and it's interesting because you, obvi I'm trying to think back to the times I would watch you guys and think like, you're obviously making a snap judgment when you see someone's outfit, whether you like it or not, but you can't say to them right in the moment, great to see you not really feeling that outfit tonight. No, you would wait till the next day and the, say it behind their backs. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Much better. Okay, so but in order to not be completely duplicitous and say, oh, wow, you look great, and then the very next day say that they didn't, what was your kind of code for what you would say when you didn't like something? It was more of what's a default to get you out of saying that the next day. And that was always, it looked much better on per, in person. Didn't photograph well. Mm, nice. But conversely, there were dresses that you could say, I hated it in person, but it photographed beautifully. Mm. But that was always sort of a little... Mm, right. As I would often say, beautiful woman, beautiful dress, not beautiful together. Did you ever hear from... <laughs> Did you ever hear from someone after the fact and they were like, well, you seemed like you like it when I, when I saw you. Oh my you. God, I had Edie Falco scream at me <gasps> at an Emmys party. And then say horrible things about me in a magazine. <gasps> and it was like, so she was, she looked terrible. And then the next year she had a stylist, the nutritionist, the trainer, the hair, the makeup, and looked amazing. And apparently in this article, which I remember she said, I don't care about those things. Okay, tell that to your plastic surgeon who just completely redid you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if she had plastic surgery. I am being metaphorical. Right. So you got to watch out because it wasn't your mom who said it. It was you. It was she, a metaphor. You, right, right, of course. Um, Wait, is metaphor the right thing for that? Is that right? Or a simile? Is it a metaphor or a simile? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's it. Too. Or an allegory. Allegory. Let me ask you a but couple... But aren't allegories like religious? Not necessarily. Okay. I have a couple last things so I want to ask you before I open it up to you all for your questions for Melissa. Um... I want to know, I mean, it's been, it's been several years now since your mom has eight. passed. Eight years. Are there, and I hope the answer is yes, are there still good friends of hers 
that you are still close enough with so that when you need kind of a fix of, of her in that way, you can go out to lunch with them or call them. Who's still around of her besties? Okay, you just saved yourself because you know you teed me up by saying I hope the answer is yes. Because <laughs> immediately I'd be like, no. <laughs> um, yes, of like, course. Who, and who are they? But who are they? Who are they? Um, well, her best friend Margie is still alive and her husband. And we email one time. They live in New York. I'm always sad I don't get to see more time with with Margie, who's hilarious. My mom and Margie used to get in so much trouble together. Um, and Margie is in every single one of my books, by the way. Every single one, because it was really her best friend, and they were so dangerous together mm. and horrible together. They used to walk up to people on the street, and you are just random people, and they've got two little Jewish ladies. Let's be honest what they are. Way overdressed for daytime. Uh, except that they lived in New York, so it all made sense. Always trying to get Cunningham to take pictures of them. <laughs> um, and they would walk up to strangers on the street, tap them on the shoulder, like, excuse me, which one of us is prettier? <laughs> <laughs> like, they used to do that to and that was her real sense of humor. Like, they thought that was hilarious. I love it. Um, we were backstage earlier waiting for you all to, to come in, and we were talking with Jamie, and as often happens, the royal family came up. Yes. And you told a story that was so great that we decided you had to tell yes. this audience, so please. So my mother was fortunate enough to actually be friends with, I know I can't say Pearl, Prince Charles anymore, but it seems very weird to say King Charles um, and Camilla. And all of you Diana lovers don't hate me, but my mom loved Camilla. She's funny. She's abroad. She gets it. She's chain smoking, talking like that. I mean, she's everything you think she would be. And that's why she's fabulous. She's just like, ah, oh, whatever, and married to the king. Um, <laughs> so my mother had a dinner party in New York for a big British artist who was a lord or a lady or something, and another low-ranking royal someone, duke, duchess, whatever, count, viscount, who knows, um, older couple, a woman had sat in one of my mother's good front silk chairs, because I remember that really upset her, <laughs> and perhaps may have piddled a little <laughs> in the chair. <laughs> so my mother tells Charles and Camilla this and won't tell them who it was, and it's making them nuts. So they're at an, all at an event, and they're coming down the receiving line, and shake it. And every time they'd get to someone, they'd look over to my mother, and she would go. <laughs> and they finally got to the person, and she went. <laughs> and they lost it. <laughs> she's like, I'm not telling you. I feel, she's like, I, I feel terrible telling you. But they kept walking, going. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, you, you all certainly have questions for Melissa. So or not. De we may have answered them all. Debbie has a microphone. If you will kindly raise your hand. Or not. She will. <laughs> just Debbie. scream. And then just, yeah, just if you don't oh. mind, deliver the question into the mic, and that way we all can hear it. If there's, if there's any audio issues, I will gladly repeat the question. There's a second mic over here. Liz, got it. So, yes. Great. What would you be doing... If somebody gave you a call or if you had a choice today or tomorrow and say, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Wow. Um, what would I want to do for the rest of my life? Stay alive forever to annoy my son. <laughs> <laughs> now, is, now, no, in, in, in all reality, uh, yeah, in, re in reality, um, God, I don't know. I'm very fortunate that I love what I do, and I'm allowed to make a living doing it. Mm. Um, and I think people, especially in the entertainment industry, lose sight of that, that they're, you know, that we are paid to do what we love. We're all very, very lucky. Um, I don't know. I need to think about that. Ooh, that was deep. I'm not a deep person. <laughs> <laughs> Just live long enough to really make sure my son is absolutely driven into therapy. <laughs> that means as a Jewish mother, I've done my job. <laughs> Hi. Yes. 
Hi, Melissa. Love you. Love your mom. Thank you. My question is, as a second generation entertainer, you obviously grew up with other kids of other entertainers. On your journey growing up, was there anyone that you grew close to because you had that very special um, element in common? People always ask me that. That's a very interesting question because I did grow up with a lot of, you know, other entertainers, children, mostly when my mom would be working Vegas. Mm. And it was a very different time, and it was two shows, the dinner show, the cocktail show. Monday and Tuesday were dark. Um, and we were like this pack that sort of ran around Vegas, obviously supervised, but we knew which was the best game room and which had the best pool and which one had the best candy store and whose parents would order the best food for the dressing room. And I mean, we, we were a little little pack. Sadly, I don't think I'm really in touch with anyone. Who were they, these kids? Oh, God. Um, the Goulet, the Edie, uh, Robert, uh, uh, Robert Steve, Goulet. no, Steve, oh, Steve Lawrence Goulet. and Igor May. They were older than us. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the sons passed away. The Rickles kids, the Sedaka kids, Abby Lane's kids. The Newhart kids I actually went to grammar school with. Um, Chaz Bono, who was Chastity. Um, God, who else? I mean, that was like, it was the parents who were working Vegas. Right. How you fabulous. Know? Um, you know, you run into people. I had lunch with Mindy Rickles probably about a year ago. You, you, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Um, but my parents were really not part of the Hollywood crowd, mm. which is interesting. I wasn't allowed to go to the school that all the Hollywood kids went to. I had to go to the very conservative school. I don't know if any, how many people from L.A. here? Okay, I wasn't allowed to go to Westlake, Brentwood, or Crossroads. I got sent. I got sent to Marlboro. Oh, <laughs> all girls, which I only survived till halfway through tenth grade, and they got shipped off to Buckley. Um, but so that was like my parents' vibe. They're like, no, 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 no. Those are two showbiz. So I think you know the Hamiltons, who were Carol Burnett's daughters. I was close mm. with the Hamiltons. Mm. You know, it was that crew. But you know, you run into each other. I love it. Okay. Debbie's got a mic. More questions, anyone? Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah, you got me trapped. <laughs> Hi, I just have a quick question about the show Mrs. Maisel and if it was based on your mom. That's a very touchy subject um, that I have spoken openly about. They claim it has nothing to do with my mother, um, that it was based on... What's the name of the producer? Pa Palladino. Oh, Amy Sherman Palladino. Palladino's uncle. Okay. Which is weird because... Whose name was Ms. Mrs. Maisel, her uncle. <laughs> yes, which is very odd because maybe he was ahead of his time. I don't know. Mm. Um, we're not allowed to use certain words that would describe that kind of an entertainer anymore. Um, and uh, I actually... My agent actually represented one of the writers who was in the writer's room... And I found out that after, and it just became, and they became very sort of vocal about that it wasn't my mom. And I have never watched an episode of the show. Mm. And all I ever wanted was for them to, and I understand people are super litigious. I just think it would have been awesome since we had the same agent, one of their writers, if I had sent me a freaking mug and a link to the first episode and say, your mother was one of many women who inspired this character. We hope you enjoy watching it as we, much as we enjoyed making it. And to this, Rachel Brosnahan reached out to me. How long ago, Sabrina? To, how long ago did Rachel reach out to me? Yeah, so in the last year and a half, Rachel Brosnahan did reach out to me. And we spoke, and she said that she was never, ever told that my mother was one of the inspirations. And when Jane Lynch thanked my mother after she won for guest star, I sent her an orchid. And I said to Rachel, I'm like, you would have a whole greenhouse by now. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> but I don't blame her, but to this day, they will not acknowledge it. Interesting. And everyone, the annoying thing is everyone said I would love the show. Right. Jerry? Yeah, thanks. Uh, your mother had a huge catalog of jokes, and um, which should be in the National Archives, I think. So what have you done with them? Uh, oh, the right, card catalog. The card catalog. Right now, they're still in my storage. We were going to send it to the Smithsonian. Um, then we decided not to because they would not guarantee it would be on permanent display. Mm. And I couldn't deal. She would kill me if she ended up in a warehouse. Mm. The woman lived for views, vistas, views, whatever. So I couldn't, you know, it's that 
tracking shot in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm. It would just not work for me. Um, Library of Congress wanted it, and now it will be going on loan to the National Comedy Center in Jonestown, New York, which is actively uh, getting every major person's work and they're doing a beautiful job and it's a fully interactive experience. Hmm. They have my mom, they have George Carlin, they have Lenny Bruce, they just got Carl Reiner. They have all of Lauren Michaels already. I mean, it's, they truly have created something incredible. And uh, we just, that's where it's going. Also, because they're going to pay to preserve it right and put it in like acid-free paper and all that stuff. So it's going to, it's going to live there until Cooper is, poor and needs to sell it to someone. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dave Carger and the fabulous Melissa Rivers. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you.